Storytellers AZ, a discussion group for people who make a living telling stories. Hello and welcome to another episode of Storytellers AZ, the podcast that's goal is to help people tell better stories. I am Tyler Hurst again, and with me today is... Laura Orsini. I am a book consultant. I help people get their books out of their heads, onto paper or the word processor, and to the market. I'm Elizabeth Newland, and I'm a realtor and a blogger. Hi, I'm Rebecca Joy, author and speaker. I'm Tyler Hurst, again, uh, still a writer. Um, <laughs> still Tyler. And still an, an experienced improv, uh, improv artist. I'm really proud of that. Anyway, today's episode is about uh, The Dip, which is a book Seth Godin wrote, uh, I don't know, no more than, than a decade ago, but I, I read it last year. And in it, it talks about um, the difficulty of, of completing projects, about how sometimes you know, you'll start off and you, you'll start off on a, on a high note and you'll go down and you realize you're in the dumps everything's tough, you know, life might be falling apart, everything's harder than, it, than, than, than you thought it would be. And there's a point where you can either give up because, you know, it's never going to get any better from here, or you can realize you're in what's called the dip, and this is going to be the toughest part. And if you work just a little bit harder and push a little bit more, you'll be able to come out and you'll be able to climb back up on the mountain of, of success or whatever you want to call it. For me, I have uh, – I actually just – I reread this book a, a couple weeks ago, and over the weekend, I started to look at a bunch of projects that I was, I was working with, and they're all, they all have their own Twitter accounts. That's how I, I denote a new project I'm working on, their own Twitter accounts and web pages. <laughs> so I was looking in Hootsuite, and I had 15 or 16 different Twitter accounts, and I realized that I just couldn't keep up with – Almost Barefoot, an anti-PR guy, and about five other, six other little projects that I've been working on for a long time. It just didn't make sense to me. Um, I always hoped that I would, you know, hey, let's buy barefootrunning.co and help people learn how to run barefoot. And it sounded like a great idea, and I still enjoy writing about it. It's just not something that I could keep up because it wasn't something I could really devote myself to. And I realized that I didn't really care about teaching people how to run barefoot. I just wanted to share stories that people could read about running barefoot. And there's a couple of clients I've had I've had the issue with too of of where everything's kind of kind of down, um, and you don't know whether to 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 cut bait or 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 keep going because you know you feel guilty. We talked about this last podcast about feeling guilt about the rules we set for ourselves. We break those, uh, and we feel we feel terrible about it. And so I was wondering if anyone here has that same type of issue, where they're at a low point, um, they have a project they know has a possibility of being finished, but when do you, when do you cut and run? I think that the, uh, the part that stops us is that fear of success. And I, I would have to relate the, the stuckness to the fear of finishing because what happens when it's done, then you have to deal with the aftermath of it being completed and either it goes or it doesn't go. Well, what if, you know? let's say, what if it's not possible for you to complete it? Let's say, um, you have a book that you're working on. Let's say, let's say Rebecca is, Let's say she's a problem client, just hypothetically. Let's say she's, let's, let's she's high maintenance and she wants a lot of stuff. And you realize that if you work 80 hours a week for the next six months, you will be able to save whatever the problem is. Uh, but you don't have that extra 80 hours every week. So when do you – what signs do you look for when you realize that it's not possible to complete and it is time to kind of jump back I out? I cannot – I can't think of anything that has been that way for me, except right. what when you were talking about the 15 projects, what came to yeah. mind, and this is not related, but it's related no, no, to no, your 15 projects, is creative people have diverse interests. <laughs> and we have so many things that are intriguing to us. And the people who succeed are the ones who can prioritize and can put stuff on the back burner and wait till they can get a team together or pass it off to somebody who can bring it, it to implementation. We want to implement all of it. And so that's how come we get 15 projects going at one time. I think it's the very creative people who have this tendency to embrace that. I am struggling right now. I have a book that I finished in December that has been very slow to ramp up because I've been putting all of my attention on my business and my clients. So my stuff comes second. But what I did was I brought in a person to hold me accountable and I have a meeting every Thursday morning to make even a little bit of progress on it. So, so I am not in a dip. I'm well, no, in you, no, extended. You, no, well, you actually are. You, you, you have recognized you're in a dip. You're not, you're, you didn't fall off a cliff. No. You're in a dip. So what the, the dip means is you can go back up. Yeah, and, I, it, and so it you're is, climbing it back is, up It slowly. is little yeah. by little climbing back up. So that's, but that's the only one that I could relate to in terms of I just I don't have clients like that. So not so much. 
Yeah, I, uh, well, on a real estate level, um, firing clients is something that definitely comes into play if uh, you've been in the business more than 10 seconds. Because um, there are people who will suck your time and you'll get to the point where you're calculating out how many dollars, if they buy a house and it ever closes, like how many dollars an hour am I going to actually make off this client? And will I ever? And at some point you just have to, you know, pull the plug. And for me, it's usually like, the emotional, if it's a really nice family and I feel like they're going to be happy and I'm going to get something out of it emotionally, I'll probably stick in. If they treat me like shit, then like, no, I'm, I'm going to pull out because it's just killing me emotionally. Um, but I do feel also the dip thing. Um, I had a moment a couple of days ago because I, I sp spend a lot of time on my website, on my blog. I have a really good dip story for you when you're done about you. Really? Uh -huh. Oh, God. Um, <laughs> so I, I spend a lot of time and energy on my blog. And um, I've gotten to the point where, yes, I creatively, I love it. I feel good about it. It has allowed me to really practice and hone my writing craft. I wasn't doing a lot of writing before then. I feel just emotionally and creatively fulfilled about it. But is it really helping? And am I going to do this forever? And like my audience isn't building, you know, leaps upon bounds. I had two months in, in April and May where uh, my readership was way up and then it's kind of like gone back down and it's just depressing. <laughs> and I'm like, when do I get to the point where I pull the plug and say this time and energy that I spend doing that, it would be better served doing something else, like working on my personal fiction and moving towards that. Um, and I'm not to that point. I, I, I do feel like it's still positive, but I, I feel like I, that's something that I have to but like But you recognize question. that point is coming up. Yeah. Well, 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 and what I was talking about shows you, I read her blog, was your garden. You did. Yeah. She she set up a garden in her backyard. She did a bunch of stuff with it. She convinced her husband to help out for, with birds and and make netting and all that. And then after a while, she got frustrated with it and kind of said, "You know what? I'm gonna leave it alone. I'm gonna stop looking at it." You realize that you were at that point of you were at the bottom of wherever it was. You weren't sure if it was a dip or if you had just fallen off a or cliff. If I was over it. <laughs> um, and it turned out that after you kind of left stuff alone, you were in a dip and it came back up because now your it garden did. looks much much nicer. And I went out today and I like spent a whole bunch of time talking to my plants. Yeah. So like, you know, trimming things. And I'm like, okay, I love you again. All right. We're still friends. Uh, so you're right. Yeah. And so, and so, and your blog will come out of the two. I mean, my, my, my personal blog did, um, of when I was writing, you know, two or three times a week and I was like, Hey, I'm getting four to 5,000 hits a month. I, you know, if I really ran, if I ramped it up more and wrote more, I bet I get more hits. But I realized what was that doing for me? Even if I was to get 20,000 hits a month, it's not like I, I don't sell anything. So what, you have what to am I? To that goal. Do you yeah. have a goal for the blog? I mean, it was, and, and it, and it really was, was my goal for the blog is to practice writing. Um, because I consider all my other writing, you know, what my, what I really do. My Real blog writing. is just, yeah. Um, but that's what it was. And it turns out it's just practice. So I, now I write on it one, I try once a week, but just whenever I, whenever I can, that I, I don't have the same, um, the same goals just for that blog. Yeah. So what about you? You wrote a book, Rebecca, when did you have your dip moment? When did you realize in, cause I've had this when I wrote uh, the last one, when did you realize that you were at your lowest point and knew that you could finish? Was there a point halfway through writing or for me, it was when I was like 2000 words from it and I was like, Oh God, I can't finish it. And then I realized I could. Yeah. Yeah. To the, yeah. Of, of 52,000 eventually. What comes to my mind, Tyler, is life is so distracting. And I'm going along, and I'm, I'm making progress, and then I think, well, I need to learn how to do a website, or I need to learn marketing, or I need to, you know, and so I get distracted and go off and learn this, and then I go off and learn that. So how far along in your book were you before you started to get seriously distracted? Because it looked, it sounds like you wrote most of your book, and then put it off for a while, Actually, and for clarification, I, I didn't write it. I collected the put stories. Whatever, okay. Whatever. So... What was your question? When did you think that um, the book wasn't going to get finished? Was there a point somewhere in there that you had to choose to either keep going or cut your losses? Uh, well, he said it sounded like, which is what you did, collected all the stories up front, got it 90% of the way done, and then yeah. it went on the shelf for a number of years. A number of years. Yes, yes, yes. We ask hard questions. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I don't know where to take this one. I'm thinking, I think of life and as, as we journey along in, in everything we do, there seems to be a, a progress up. And then you slide down, and then it's just the journey of life, and the dips, and the the valleys, and um, I, I can oh goodness, the the goals and the intentions were always there, 
And I think Laura hit it on the head, for me at least, is the, the fear of success. When this book gets out there, that's going to put me out there. Yeah. And honestly, I don't know what's going on within me, but it's like, oh, my gosh, you know, everyone's going to see me, you know. And, it, and it's, uh, is it rational? Probably not. Am I human? Oh, yeah, I am. <laughs> That's so weird to me because that's not, people say that, that fear, I've heard that before, the fear of success. And, and I'm like, I'm not afraid of being successful. <laughs> I'm afraid of sucking. And for well, me, that's it. There's, yeah. you, it there's is. two sides of the yes. same coin. Yes. Honestly, well, are. you're, what we're afraid of is change because failure changes us and so does success. Because either one changes the life that we're leading right now. Because if you're a failure and you stop doing whatever you want to be doing, then that's out of your life. If you succeed, then maybe you'll be promoted or you live in a nicer house, you buy a nicer car, or you just have some sort of a sense of, of a greater sense of self-worth at that point. Oh, you know, I just had a thought when you said that about a, a, a very significant dip I had when I was 25, I moved to the New York City area oh. and I had a horrible, horrible adjustment period of being there. I was living with an older sister who we are almost mortal enemies and it was awful, but, and I cried every night mm -hmm. and my boyfriend said, I plane ticket is yours if you want to come home. And I was like, I am not quitting. Mm -hmm. And it was just a sheer utter determination to stay that made me live through the unbearable part of it and make it through. And it was, it was almost eight years before I, I decided I'd had enough and came back, but it wasn't a failure at that point Yeah, it's, because I had lasted through the, right. the, the impossible part. And that brings up a good point too about failure is, is I feel, I feel terrible when I don't finish something that I set out to do. But after a while, you kind of have to realize that it's just not going to happen. Um, like my, my barefoot running blog I talked about earlier was an example of that. I just, I couldn't keep up with it. It just wasn't possible. And it was, it was going to hurt me more to try to keep up with it than it was going to be just to end it. Um, and does that mean I'm not going to be doing running lessons in Phoenix anytime soon? Yes. Does that really matter to me? I thought it did, uh, but it doesn't anymore. So is there any time that you guys have... But didn't you have to go through the process of discovery I did, and that's, and that, well, I mean, no, that's... And, and that was very useful, and I would do it again. Yeah. Um, I'm just glad that I finally made that decision just to say, you know what, I'm done with it. I'm not going to take well, it down. Well, I think there may be the distinction between a passion and an interest, yeah. a passion and a passing interest. And so, you know, the passions are the ones that we stick with and oh. we, we live with and, and we come out of the dip for. But the passing interests we let fall by the wayside and it's okay. Well, and it seems like what it comes down to and what's common in everything that we're saying is, is it emotionally satisfying? Mm -hmm. And it's hard to know, is it going to be emotionally satisfying before you've actually tried it? Yeah. So I don't think it can always be considered a failure if you've tried something and you've realized this is not... It's not doing it for me, it's and not. then you let it go. Yeah, we. I had that at start at startup weekend. Um, I had we we had our idea, and then we spent a day tearing it apart. And then Sunday morning, I woke up and realized, hey, I have a great idea. It's going to work if this one thing is correct. And then I read it, and the thing I thought wasn't correct. And so we. And so you call, and I wrote about this. You can call the startup weekend. My startup weekend idea was a failure, but. I learned so much about business in that two-hour conversation we had to ripping the idea apart mm -hmm. that I would have done that again in a second. Uh, and I hope a lot of other people would too because, you know, I, you know, we talk about fail fast, whatever. I don't, I don't do enough things to be able to fail fast all the time. Um, I just think you should learn from all your failures. Fail as quickly or as slowly as you want to, but make sure you, know, make sure you learn something from them. So I don't know why I went here, but what, years ago I was learning how to ski. And so I was very conservative. I stayed. I didn't want to fall. I, so I did everything I could. You'll never learn. Yeah. <laughs> and then I stayed on my feet. But did I progress? Did I mean, so when I got the snowboard, that was a different story, you know? Well, then that's, that's interesting you bring that up because I learned to ski first and then I went out snowboarding. I tried it twice and I hurt myself so bad, so bad that I never went back again. Uh, so for snowboarding, I saw there was a dip and there was no, it was never coming back up for me. I knew I loved skiing. There was an emotional payoff. Yeah, it wasn't yeah. worth it. I knew, I knew I, I knew I loved skiing. I did not love being sideways enough to keep on trying. It hurt so much. It just wasn't worth it. So I went back to skiing. So yes, I'm a snowboard failure, but it doesn't make it any worse. I don't think there but is I'm, a failure. But, but I'm glad that I know that now, yes. but I really don't ever want to snowboard again because it hurts so much. <laughs> it's cold too because you have to sit on the mountain and it's wet. Well, I, I agree. There's that too. So Okay, uh, that will do it for now. Ladies, thank you very much uh, and we will see you next week. Thank you for listening to Storytellers AZ. We'll see you next time. <laughs>